Let's I go. think this is the stage where you want to be. Okay, Euro. Yeah. Just to introduce you, I've known you as a speaker like 10 years ago. You were raised here in Amsterdam um, and we had a big event and you were talking about how you could collect all the data from the mobile operator and then actually see what was happening in the city. When people got up, where they moved, where there's a traffic jam and, and how you could share this data with the police and, and do good things with them. Now, a lot of things have happened in your life since. You built a company, you sold a company, you traveled, you bought companies and sold companies. All the time you were teaching about data, and now you have a new company also working in data mm -hmm. because now you can uh, do a lot more with it. So mm -hmm. tell us all about data in Internet of Things times. Fine, there thanks, you go. thanks, Monique. And um, thanks to you guys. I mean, there is a joke that goes when the audience is not that big, right? It goes like this. I was once in a presentation, there was one person in the audience, just once, and I was embarrassed, and she was embarrassed. Hmm? I said, okay, lady, I'll do it anyway, you know? So I'll give my talk, and you know, we just do as business as usual. She said, yeah, that, that's fine, but do it fast, because I need to clean up here, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I work at the interface between IoT and data, and uh, I always work in these two things, and um, I always been in academia and in business, both startups and corporations. And what I want to discuss today, what happens at this interface between Internet of Things and uh, data, times data analytics, artificial intelligence. I'll do it from a practical point of view, so no big ideas, big things. I'll just give you some snapshots of things that we see, that we have done, that seem to work, that seem to have traction, and some considerations about what we think tends to work better now. And um, this perspective is pre predominantly from the business side. Hmm? I don't have particular experience in wearables, in domotics, and things like that. I don't think the business is there, it's not going to be there for a long time. Hmm? Therefore, I'm going to do it more from the more, let's say, uh, industry side. But first, just one uh, first thing. So I just use this general framework, which is 2M2A, to see how we can position different things going on. And 2M2A stays for monitoring, management, augmentation, and autonomy, which seems to be a sort of progression hmm? where things are moving in terms of data and IoT. And it is fair to say that we are at the left-hand side now. We talk about the right-hand side, but we are the left-hand side, right? So I'll, I'll sort of flow between all these kind of things. On the left-hand side, you have you check products that connect to the internet, you want to see what's the environment around that, do they operate or not. Management, you start looking at updating, personalizing, getting some sort of, let's say, remote control. Augmentation when the information allows the products and the systems to operate more or less uh, <coughs> independently, which brings you to autonomy when they're intelligent enough to do their job without your intervention. In practice, if you, if you think of an elevator, it was like this. If the only thing about an elevator is an anomaly detection, you have a service request. If all the sequence of anomalies are detected, you have a pattern of operation. If you have multiple logs, you can get a profile. If that is correlated with electricity, environment, and so on, you can predict what's going to happen. If you have different millions of devices, you can let them operate autonomously because you can create intelligence. Right, so that's the 2M2A flow that goes through this. Um, two more general slides and then we go into applications. McKinsey published last year a report that, well, the summary is this one. If you look 2025 and they have the crystal ball, I don't know if their crystal ball is better than mine, but still a crystal ball, right? So trust this with a pinch of salt. Which are the sectors that are going to be um, more attractive in 2025, they call it about settings. So they don't talk about healthcare, they don't talk about industry, they don't talk about the supply chain. They look about workflows and they group them in groups. And you can see, for instance, that the biggest one turns out to be factories. A very mundane type of application for the IoT is still the biggest potential business that you have there. And you also see that the home it is a fairly small one. It's still a large one in absolute terms, but it's still a very small. So it's not the place where going forward that seems to be the biggest market. What's interesting is the human. You see the blue line is what is the, the low end of the estimate, and the other one is the high end of the estimate. What's interesting there, where you see the Fitbits and all these guys, is that there's an enormous uncertainty in that thing. So it might work, may not work, nobody really knows. One in the other thing. So we're I think the business really is, is in the factories, is in the cities, in the outside, which is supply chain and all that. 
And that, if you confront the venture capital investments in the sector, this is CB Insights, this is all the IoT investments from the first quarter 2011 up to the first quarter 2016. You can see there's a nice growth, but you can also see that initially the industrial part, it was very small. Hmm? You can see how it goes up here. Hmm? This is where venture capitals put their money. And this excludes all the money that goes from companies, which is not included here. And most of the organizations have their own investments, which are actually in the area that was shown before. So in general, the IoT in the business side is far bigger than IoT in the consumer side, even if we don't talk about that. You know? All the conversations about the consumer IoT, most of the business is not there. Let me start with the first case study. The first case study is about how b little data can be a great thing. So this is a door to balloon um, use case, which is actually going on in Dutch hospital in Leiden at this point in time. So door to balloon is the time that it takes if you have a heart attack to put a stand like this one into the inside the heart. So it goes through the veins hmm, and then it goes into the heart and blows up. Uh, the time it takes from the moment you get to the time you actually get this implant is fundamental. That dictates your chances for survival and condition. What hospitals need to do is to measure how do good they perform in such a way they find bottlenecks that can reduce them. So door to balloon is the time from the moment you receive the call, the moment you receive the treatment, right? And they all started to figure out ways. They keep track manually now, and that's the same everywhere in the world. And they have considered various options like Wi-Fi tracking, you give patients a tag, and it can be maybe RFID, and all, you know, tons of options. None of them work because they're too expensive. So you couldn't really have a good use case. And then beacons came around, and tablets that read beacons came around, and then they simply use them. And that's the way they work. So the guys in the ambulance receives a beacon. You know what's a beacon, right? It's very inexpensive, $5, Bluetooth. It just blinks, doesn't do anything else. Hmm? I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. It's the most stupid device that has been invented in the last 50 years, right? That's the only thing it does, right? But it does it cheaply, it does it continuously. The best part of it is the protocol is standardized, so that device can be detected by a tablet or a phone or anything. So instead of putting expensive infrastructure in the hospital, you put tablets in the walls, wherever you want to measure the times. So the patient goes to the, the ambulance, gets into the hospital, these tablets get the patient, the next tablet gets the next position, and so on and so on, until it gets treatment, hmm, which is down here. I'm not sure how this works, but anyway, this is treatment, and then you measure. It's a very simple way of keeping track how the, the hospital works. Hmm? What's the difference between what was done in the past and this, which is all based on the IoT technologies, if you want, is that the infrastructure is extremely limited. It doesn't cost almost anything to install it. Hmm? You can pay per use. You don't have to buy a huge thing to actually have this working. And it can use very simple tablets and simple tools. All these things connected makes a difference between not doing it and actually doing it. So this is, and by the way, the data it captures is very small. Hmm? So this is one simple case, a small thing. Let me do a detour and talk about avatars. Um, if you want to have all these systems to talk to each other, you have to find a way of abstracting away the functioning of the device from what you really care about, right? So most platforms, most IoT platforms m work more or less in this way. You get on one side the devices, can be vehicles, can be cars, bikes, doesn't matter. They channel the data to the cloud hmm, where intelligence usually sits. Um, um, I don't think, let's say, local infrastructures are the solution. I think that the cloud is going to beat up everything, but that seems obvious statement. And then somewhere the other side, they, which are consumed by whatever applications and so on. Inside the cloud, you have some form of abstraction of the physical reality, which is back there. So how do you do that? Many, th you know, if you have seen the presentation before about the home installation, this guy from Tweakers, hmm? it was really, you know, if, if you look at that, it was really a struggle to put all these things together. One of the things is that every single sensor has its own data model, and then you have to code how these different data models combine. I mean, that's nonsense. It's fine now, but obviously it's not a way to scale. So what needs to happen between is what, you know, people call avatars, call shadows, and so on. These are representations. Think of them as the Facebook of devices. Hmm? When you connect with other people through Facebook, you have that interface of data, timeline, your feed, and so on. And that's how you talk to others. You decide what to exchange with others, right? 
So that interface between you and the rest is mediated by this page. Well, devices will have the same Facebook page, let's say an avatar, which basically goes from the physical object to the communication to the device, and then one piece of the equation stops there, people will start writing applications as the avatar. So in that way, you can separate those that deal with the hardware side from those that deal with the software side, and that's going to be one of the scaling elements. For instance, this is one of the things that you know, illustrates that. This is a bike. The bike as an object doesn't have any sense in the sensing sense, right? Um, but if you have, in this case, it's two sensors. One sensors in the wheel, and the other one is the iPhone of the driver. The avatar taps data from both and creates an abstraction of the bike, which is this page here. So you can write apps against this page. You forget about the bike, huh? fitness, and all the other things. You don't have to care. How the information goes between these two is not your problem as a developer. It's a problem of those that create the avatar. Things like this is what platforms will have to include if you want to really create something that works. End of the first detour, from the small data, I go to the largest data set that I know of, hmm? and it is in sports. Hmm? I'm not sure what it is at university, but you remember something like this at some point in time, right? Communication, it's you know, the simplest form of communication. Radio communication is at the bottom. It's a wave, which you know, it has its own shape and then occupies a piece of frequency. Yeah? 2.4 gigahertz is Wi-Fi, all right? This is the way of communicating. Another form, which is on top, which is called pulse communication. Small pulses of energy, very, very short, nanoseconds, and then silence. Another nanosecond, then silence. If you see them in frequency, they occupy all the frequency spectrum, but the energy is so small that it stays below noise, right? It was invented in the Second World War just to have communication that cannot be detected. That's called ultra-wideband. It has a couple of nice features, is that if you want to locate an ultra-wideband pulse, you can do it very, very precisely. If you want to locate a Wi-Fi device, it's very hard. You have noise, you get errors. So locating tags that have Wi-Fi, for instance, an environment here, five meters, 10 meters. Ultra-wideband, 20 centimeters, 10 centimeters. All right, so in the first applications was used in hospitals to locate infusion pumps, in refineries to locate people working. And then somebody started doing this. They say, wait, I can measure high, how, how high this skateboard goes. Hmm? You can do it with a camera, but maybe you do it real time by putting a small tag inside the skateboard. The tag blinks hundreds of times every second. Hmm? You get receivers that measure, and then you actually measure in real time. So what we did with the NFL in the US, that was two years ago, we convinced them basically to use the sign to track the pass. So all the players in the NFL now, in the United States, they wear two tags in the shoulders, left and right. And those tags blink 60 times per second. Hmm? Every stadium in the United States, so all the stadiums where they play and all the stadiums where they practice have sensors around. And this sensor captured the entire, let's say, this. And then you have something like this. So you have the entire play, the entire mix of the game in real time at very, very high precision. Because the two tags, you know, they measure movement. It's all in 3D, so you can see the orientation, you can see the speed, you can see everything. You can see in real time the distance, you can see the path, you can see all these kind of, say, combinations. The way people use it, of course, you're in training because they have total visibility of every player the entire games, but they start using, um, and I, I think it's public, but I'm not sure. But anyway, they start using it to feed games which have um, augmented reality. Hmm? Therefore, you can put yourself in the position of a gamer, of a player here, right? And you can see the real movement of everybody else while the game was played. Hmm? So by doing this, you have a certain number of options, a variety of options that are all based on the fact that you have total visibility about the entire location of all players. So of course, then you can add all the sensors for, for health and so on. I think this is the largest data set in sports at this point in time, and it's terabytes of data every single game. Hmm? Because basically an airplane in terms of production of data. Let me do another detour. And the, the first detour is about the fact, you know, when all the things that we see here, we really pick up. Because for now, I got two implementations. Each one is a point implementation. You have to go back to where the IoT really starts. And it has to do with two things. Where's the, the, the standards and where the first technologies that enable that? This t-shirt here is about Cisco, 1991, 1,000 years ago. 
see all the protocols that made sense at that point in time. Hmm? So this is pre-internet, right? It was not clear which one was going to win. Eventually, you don't have any of this right now, but that was, at the time, all the things they need to support. Home automation now is like this. Hmm? So the real, the technical term to describe home automation now, it's a mess. Hmm? So mess is a technical term, describes the market for IoT for home automation. We got 28 protocols that do not work. You got tools that come out now, and then the next year, there's the same tool updated that doesn't talk to the old version of the platform. Hmm? You get gateways that do not talk to different providers. It can't go on that way, right? So that won't, will never work. But things are going to change. And one of the big plays, in my view, that's going to change this is ARM. I, I, I guess everybody knows ARM is the chip designer. So many, most of the chips that you have in your smartphones are from ARM. ARM is, is, is already released, already last year, a set of tools in which the chips themselves have the protocols to talk device language to the cloud. That protocol is called Co-op Lightweight and it's a strange name, but it doesn't matter. So this is standard adopted by a variety of parties. What happens is the following. That chip knows how to push sensor data to the cloud in a certain protocol. That chip is going to be implemented in a board. That board is going to go into the washing machine. The washing machine is going to hit the market. Then you have an entire train of technologies. They all talk the same language. That will come to the market in a few years, right? That's when things are going to change. Before that, you know, you're going to have all this mess. When this comes to the market, then you're going to see basically this. Hmm? So you really see the inflection. So I'm not sure if these numbers are big. You look at the estimations, the estimates that they make, they are reasonable. So I think that is going to be the game changer. I'm not it will take from chips to go to boards, from boards to go to devices, devices to hit the market, right? So this chain will take time, maybe two years, something like this, but that's when we are going to talk about IoT in a serious way. End of detour. We have, in any case, tons of data and tons of sensors, even without going to this. And I'm going to talk you about incident prediction, uh, which is a project that we are finishing now. It has been going on for years. The question is the following. With all the data we have about roads, the sensors that we have in the roads, can we predict where the next road accident is going to be? Legitimate question, right? Seems to be hard because it depends on so many things, you know? It depends on the traffic, it depends on the behavior, it depends on the weather and so on. So that's the question. Can we actually do it? Well, you know, if you think about the fact that we have years of data for doing this, and all this system here might be as complex as you like, but it is constrained, it follows rules, it's a serial system, cars have to have limits of speed, they cannot move in all degrees of freedom. And if you have many years of data about traffic and weather, and many incidents, then you can think about training a machine to learn how this works. And that's exactly what we are doing. What we use is this stuff here. This is sensors before the Internet of Things. You know, there have been sensors before the IoT. These are loops, right? <laughs> There's just simple induction loops. Yeah, I say, there's no way. I didn't understand. No, no, that's a, uh, impossible. These are the simplest possible sensor you can imagine. These are all cables. It's a huge infrastructure. But they are every 500 meters. And they measure flow. They measure the type of vehicle. Huh? And therefore, you can basically understand the entire work of the highway. Now, how about using this as an input the same way you train neural networks to train recognition of cats, dogs, or other things, right? Neural networks are a standard tool now. Ten years ago, they were impossible to use. Three, four years ago, they became mainstream, so you got many flavors, and all the code is available. So what we basically do, we teach neural networks to recognize traffic patterns over many years, hmm? and to say in the next 30 minutes in this stretch of 10 kilometers is going to be an accident or is going to be no accident. But the best part is this. You get it 84% of the times. Hmm? If you start getting a machine that detects incidents with 85% of times, then you start getting road systems that they alter it themselves to avoid the incident to take place. Hmm? Then now you start really taking intelligence that alters the way the system works. And this is just based on old sensors. So it is just, say, very, very old type of sensing technologies. There's another very old type of sensing technology, and this you know, what you mentioned before, Monique, is that we are all sensing the environment where we live through our mobile devices. 
telecom operators are capturing that one. So you can see a carrier, a telecom operator in two ways. These are the guys that actually help you communicate, or these are the sensor of collective behavior. If you think of them as sensors of collective behavior, you can get all the data and model how the system works. So we have done many models. I grew up in Italy, so this is about Italy. And here we model the entire tourism sector in the country based on all the traces of all mobile phones in the entire country. Hmm? And this is how it looks like. This is, by the way, it's 2013, but that's the same. We can do it this morning. So these are all the foreigners that visit Italy over time. And this is data every hour. Hmm? This is summer 2013. Ah, if you recognize the geographies, Milan, there, Rome, here, Venice, you can see that they all concentrate in several areas. It is more interesting if you look at this. This is the Chinese that visit Italy. Actually, Chinese, they do not visit Italy. They visit four cities, right? So it doesn't make sense to promote the country in China. You have to promote four cities in China. Or maybe you have to promote the country because they just go to four cities. In any case, it does make a difference, right? So Chinese do not go to Italy, they go to Rome, to Florence, to Venice, and they have big spikes the way they move. The Germans do the whole, totally different things. Italy for them is the first sand, hmm? the first time they see sand. So they all go down to the coast, the north coast and the lakes. Hmm? And you see the spikes during summer. Now all this is, you know, maybe interesting, nice, but it's essentially it's just showing information which is very hard to capture in a different way. And now it gets interesting. Because this one here, it is based, we have traces of everybody, we calibrate the traces with the known spending in certain areas. Hmm? So you can create a model, you can create a machine which has been trained recognizing pattern of communication and movement with pattern of spending, and you extrapolate that to the entire country. So what you see here, the bar, is how much tourists spend at that point in time, at that place. Hmm? So this is a map of money money in space and time. Hmm? And then you can see that there are places where you have lots of people, hmm? they don't spend much. Now, not good. <laughs> places where they spend a lot of money and there are not too many people, they are great. And you have the cash cows where you have many people and actually they spend a lot. Of course, there are places where you have nobody, don't spend, but you don't care about those. The interesting thing here is that you're actually can model, you can create machines that learn to, to understand patterns, they are calibrated on known spending and they can predict spending. You can do more, you can calibrate machines that are able to predict where everybody is. So this is a, a system that predicts where everybody in the country is going to be in the next hour. You got 60 million people, hmm? I snap them now and I want to know where they are going to be in one hour. Hmm? And I get the precision at 81%. So basically, I know where everybody is going to be the next hour, 81%. So you can create origin destination matrices for transportation, not about the averages of the future, but what's going to be in the future. Just like you're not to control the transportation, the highway, based on the average of incidents, whether the incident is going to happen there or not. And this is how it works. This is people in Milano in one day, and then we move the time, and this is where they go. Hmm? This is how they percolate around the country. So you lock everybody in one place, you let them go in the future, hmm? and this is what happens, right? So I'll go back, let me see. This is the future, hmm? and at some point you will see that it goes back to Milano, hmm? and this is where everybody was, hmm? and the rest that you see here, it's all a prediction. It's all predictive movement, right? I don't know where they go, I know they're predicted. The machines, what they do, they learn continuously. They predict the next hour, and then we see what happened the next hour, and they change completely the way they work, and that's called online learning, and they move on. So for me, this is what happens at the interface of IoT and data analytics, and that was my story. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's, it's truly, extremely interesting what is happening if you have that, many, that much data. So you collected these data with the company, and, and it's the government that uses it, or who, who makes it? Corporations, government yeah. corporations. Yeah. You yeah. just sell the sets? No, you sell... You, you, you sell no, predictions? No, no the, the services. You know, yeah. the intelligence that for doing something with that data. Questions from the audience? Yes, myself. The, um, the final case with the tourists and the, um, uh, the probably the cell phones that you... Mm -hmm. like, who was... Who was the client? Who's the brief? How does how does how do how do these predictions exist in the market? So here we have uh, 
this particular case, there are several customers, several use cases going on. The first custom was the minister hmm, of the tourism, which asked me, you know, help, help him out, figure out how we can use smarter data to, to decide where to put one billion per year of investments in promotion. Right? So on one billion is quite a bit of money, right? Hmm? And then if you do it like many countries do it, you basically, you can drop it from the air and see where it goes, hmm? or you can try to figure out if I do this, this is going to, going to happen. So that's the first, so the central government. All the regions, in, in this country in particular, actually five or six are introducing this service in, um, in the day-to-day. -day. So they want to get what happened the last, let's say, few months and figure out how to move forward. The prediction in particular is for transportation companies. And actually the prediction is actually in the city transportation because of, you know, as you start thinking about dynamic serving customers hmm, with transportation, you really need to find out what's going to be the origin destination demand in the future instead of what I had on average in this period of time. Hmm. So the transportation company in this case is the private sector. Hmm. So it, it, you know, it, there are a few. Yeah. Yeah. More questions from the audience. Feel free. You're still here, so you must be completely, truly interested, right? <laughs> This is the stuff you want to work on, basically. You told me before that you have a foundation and a company. Basically, you is this patented te technology or what, what is patented technology? You have a patent on the technology? Yeah, yeah. some of yeah. these things are patented. Yeah, the, the prediction of human prediction, that is, uh, I think it's one patent, and I think so. Yeah. But most of the other software that we use is actually open source code that comes from Google, that comes from Facebook, that comes from Baidu. All your networks, for instance, use for speech recognition. You just tweak the whole thing and you, you apply the, 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 this, these things to predict incidents. It's not trivial, eh? no. It's, uh, no, because all requires fairly large cloud implementations, all requires, you know, very skilled, um, let's say, physicists, mathematics to put the models. It, it requires 99% mistakes and one thing that works. No. <laughs> so where do you get your people? Well, they are all over the place. You know. yeah, so uh, they are they're in the UK, uh, they are in, 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 in Spain, they are in, uh, in Athens, they are in Poland. You know, it's, 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 a, it's a mess. I, I care more about who they are, how good they are, instead of where they are. Okay. Well, maybe some of these people want to come and have a chat with you yeah, afterwards. Yeah, let's have a talk. Okay. <laughs> well, you are. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, guys.